Um, so if you were to look around for definitions of, of observability, you would find something like collect data about a program's ex execution, modules, internal states, and the communication among components. Infer internal states of a system from externally available data. Um, certainly makes sense, particularly for running live production systems, because obviously what we cannot do there usually is like attach a debugger and start like up, start up our ID and kind of track down problems or issues like that. But we somehow have to collect all the necessary data from the system continuously to understand what's going on there and be able to observe the system. Um, a definition that uh, I find a little bit more to the point and more practical is this one that I found on uh, the Ubuntu website actually, um, which uh, defines it as when the telemetry you collect and the way you process it enables you to know and investigate in a timely fashion how your software system is performing, what issues are occurring and what their impact is. Um, now that is something that is uh, way more uh, practical in the sense it is about uh, observing the performance of your system. It is about detecting issues, but as opposed to other methods, doing that in a timely fashion. Um, and that actually brings me to my uh, next uh, point. I'm sure all of you are doing some sort of this or can relate to that in, 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 in some way or another. I'm definitely am guilty of, or have been guilty in many occasions of, of doing some of those practices. Uh, talking about common practices for how you monitor your system and react to issues that are far from ideal, but are quite common in the in the software world out there. So when we talk about monitoring your system, how do you know like the performance is enough, the memory is enough, the application is running stably? Um, do you like kind of just close your eyes, hope for the best, cross your fingers um, and, and, and hope that nothing crashes? When we're talking about errors are happening, what's the way you get notified? Is it um, angry mass emails from uh, several of your users informing you that kind of there's a problem, something's not working, or do you have something else? Um, how do you know when's a good time to take the system down, do maintenance, publish a new version, version etc.? Sometimes it's easy, lunchtime, Friday afternoon maybe, but that's uh, a lot more difficult already if we're talking several time zones, globally avail available applications, uh, different cultures maybe. Um, how do you know when's uh, a good time that your system is, uh, is not being used or is being used less, you can take it down for a moment. Um, also, um, maybe you developed your own solution to answer some of those questions, a custom solution. Uh, you probably invested quite a bit of time and effort there. It's something you have to maintain. Um, as an outcome, you probably get a few basic answers to those questions. You maybe, maybe it's a simple ping to see if the machine is still up and running. Maybe you're collecting a little bit of data about memory consumption. Uh, things like that, but it's uh, in the end, it's fairly basic information that you're probably getting out of there. Um, and then when we're talking about reacting to issues now, um, what's your typical reaction there? Maybe again, some of those cases, I'm sure some of you will be able to relate to. Server restart, and again, hoping for the best that fixes the problem, throw more CPU power, more memory um, at the application, put it on a bigger server, hope that um, keeps it running stable. Um, Endless tedious discussions with your users, having them describe the problem that occurred, what exactly they were doing, trying to figure out where the problem might be, um, long email chains, long phone calls, um, hoping users remember still exactly what they were doing. Uh, maybe you go the dangerous route, attach a debugger to the live production system, if that's even possible uh, within your IT infrastructure. Um, or then you tediously manually pull together logs from a dozen different systems, um, sift through them and, and kind of hope that you find what could be going wrong or what could be causing an issue. Um, these are very, very common things that we see a lot. And again, as I said, like I'm definitely guilty of uh, many of those in, in, in several instances, um, but they're not the best solution to either of those problems. Um, and that is why we're interested in observability. Um, because it's a way to measure and monitor the performance by co continuously collecting metrics. Um, by doing that in, in, in one place, doing that automatically, continuously. Um, having a system that actually alerts us when there's an issue, when something is going wrong. Not, not the users from, uh, not the emails from, from end users that are complaining about something not working. Um, having logs and the traces uh, necessary to debug uh, the system from the outside and find what and where it's exactly going wrong. 
having all of that in, in, in one place, having a tool that allows us to drill down on that information, get to the detail level, um, that is what observability is really about. Um, so why do we want all of that? Well, um, it's quite obvious at this point. Um, ideally, we would want to predict when a performance bottleneck is coming up before it becomes an actual issue, before the system crashes, before it gets um, painfully slow. Um, ideally, we also want to react before users notify us of problems, uh, react in a timely fashion, um, start analyzing the issue, resolve it quickly by having the necessary data available. Um, and if you really love your users, um, you can also use all of that information to proactively optimize the system, to continuously check what are the slowest functionalities, what are the slowest views in my system, is there something that I can do to improve the user experience, what should I focus my development efforts uh, on, and then surprise your users by an even better system with the next release. Um, so there's a lot you can do when you have that data available continuously. Um, both from like predicting issues to reacting faster to proactively optimizing the system. Um, and that is where uh, Body and Observability Kit comes into place. Um, Body and Observability Kit is one of our commercial add-ons that allows you to easily integrate observability in your Vardin application. It's part of our uh, Prime, the All Enterprise, and the Ultimate subscriptions. Um, and um, it's part of the so-called concept of acceleration kits that we have, among other kits, that are meant to save you time and costs in development and especially also in maintenance of that infrastructure um, for things that should be fairly common and standard, like, for example, observability. Um, so that is uh, one of those kits that we offer and that will allow, uh, will allow it to you to easily integrate that in your, uh, in your ex into your existing body application instead of rolling your own solution, uh, wasting time and effort on that and having to maintain that over time. Um, what uh, Vardin Observability Kit gives you is uh, detailed observability for your Vardin-based web applications. Uh, it's very easy to integrate as uh, we, can, we will see later. And it does not only cover just the standard Java metrics, like a few basic JVM metrics, uh, metrics about uh, database pools, about JPA queries, but includes a lot of uh, body-specific information, like um, fetches from data providers, uh, access to different UIs, files, navigation events, and so forth. And um, very interesting, it's also um, seeing the answers to the survey earlier, it's uh, back-to-back, end-to-end. Uh, so it covers both back-end and front-end uh, parts of the application. Uh, you do also get tracing information for, for client-side events, client-side errors, for example. Um, so it's a complete solution for your volume web application. Um, here is an, a, a, a quick animation, a quick example of a uh, Hello World app running on the left side where we click a button to simulate a client-side error. And then on the right side in Grafana, uh, one of the monitoring tools, it shows up immediately. You can drill down and you can see the same exception you're seeing in the browser console on the left side, you get there on the right side in the, in the tracing tool. Um, a pretty convenient way of, of keeping track of those errors, of analyzing what's going on and uh, being able to drill down on that. Um, and last but not least, um, observability kit is based on the open telemetry standard, um, which allows you to integrate this with a variety of third party tools that you might already be using or might be interested in. Um, and to explain that a little in a little more detail, um, this is basically what where body and observability kit fits into the bigger picture. You have your body and applications, and observability kit integrates in those as an add on and does. The focus is on the uh, core task that um, observability kit um, can kind of contribute to an already existing system. And that is collecting these, uh, the traces, collecting the metrics, collecting the data, uh, pulling out all that data from the client side, from the browser, from the uh, body internal, uh, internal, so to say, collecting all that data and forwarding that then to open telemetry collectors. Um, the beauty of this setup is that this minimizes um, the impact that uh, this has on the Vardin application because all it does is collecting the data and handing it off um, immediately to the, uh, to the collectors. Um, this also nicely integrates uh, in the bigger system because those collectors are all, uh, and, and this being a, a standard, 
they can also gather data from other applications that might not be written in Vardin, that might use other frameworks. They can also collect the data from your cloud or, or local infrastructure about your cluster, about your cloud environment. Um, pull all of that together and then forward this data to observability tools um, and uh, time storage databases that are optimized for those specific purposes. So instead of us trying to build some nice UI to analyze that data and provide that data, we focus on collecting the data, the strength of, uh, of uh, on our strength, so to say, and then rely on existing polished, really great tools uh, to store and analyze that data. Um, some are mentioned here. Um, other popular ones that you might know are New Relic or Dynatrace. Again, this being the uh, following the open telemetry standard allows you to basically choose the tool you want or you might already be using and integrate with that, uh, collect your uh, uh, metrics and traces from Vardin applications into those tools. Um, to see all of that in action now, I'm going to hand over to Matthew, who will show you a few um, realistic use cases and how you can actually use Observability Kit and the collected data to track down, trace down the issue and, and figure out what's going on. Right, thank you very much, Jürgen. That was a great introduction. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so um, for this demo, I'm going to be going through, like Jürgen said, a few um, real world use cases that we've uh, brought together. And these are going to be focusing on the uh, back end traces, but I will um, show how the front end traces could be uh, diagnosed. Um, also, um, I believe they're using these, uh, these use cases. We've got a demo application, which you actually saw a small video of uh, a few slides ago. And this can actually be found in our observability kit GitHub repository. So you can delve into it and, um, and look at it for yourself. It's uh, set up to export telemetry to the default ports um, and on your local machine. So if you have any of these um, observability tools, you can connect it up with those. Um, for this demo, I'm going to be using uh, the Jager tool to analyze the traces and spans. This is designed for development and uh, may not be suitable for a production environment. So let's go on to the first use case. Uh, the first use case, I'm going to look at uh, a report that a user maybe has, um, has given us that says that there's some sort of intermittent failure in an application. Uh, in this case, there's a button on our web app that uh, is sometimes working, sometimes not working. So the first step is to uh, reproduce the error. This is our application. And this say hello button is the button that has been reported. And so what should happen is when I click say hello, you'll see a notification pop up in the bottom left. And let's try it a few more times. Another time, it's fine. Third time, fourth time. Ah, the fifth time didn't work. So this is already, as I said, running Observability Kit. And so we can look at the Jaga UI, which is here. And we'll just refresh these. And you can see that there are uh, there's a graph at the, the top here. And this is kind of showing all the traces that have been collected. Uh, the size of the, uh, the circle there is how long each trace took in relative terms. And this is like a timeline. And then we have a list of the um, of the traces down here. Uh, so we've got one here that's got a couple of errors in. So I'll open that up. And OK, so we've got four spans. And here you can see that we've got uh, the initial uh, post that was made from the front end. So this is where Jürgen was talking about, we're getting front-end observability. Um, but as you can see, the error is not coming from the front-end. So we have to delve all the way down. And this bottom span um, is coming from the Vardin button, say hello. So that's the button we'd be looking at. 
when it's clicked. So we'll open that up and then have a look at the logs. And inside here, we've got a stack trace. And you can see here that uh, we've got a specific location of where this exception has come from within our own application. It's line 37 of Hello World View. And so this would be the starting point to then look back into your code and find out what is causing this exception. So that's just an example of um, a, an error that's happening in your system, maybe intermittently, um, and then being able to trace it back to where it comes from. So we'll go on to the second use case. So for this use case, um, we've had users reporting that there's a page that um, has a slightly slower initial load than um, when they go back to it. So this is maybe that there's some sort of data being uh, brought in. And we'll just have a look and see what that page is and what it looks like. So here's the page. And you see a bit of a load. It's not too bad. I, I think this would be a fairly acceptable load time. But then if we go back and again, it's a little quicker. So there's obviously something happening there. Um, so we'll have a look at Jaeger again. And we can see that there's a couple of uh, traces here that are taking more time than the other traces around them. So we have one here that has 1,011 spans and it's taking um, a little longer. There's another one here that's taking one second. So over one second, over a thousand spans, this looks like it could be the issue. And in here, yeah, you can see there's a lot of selects going on here. So this is the database uh, calls. Uh, the first database call is selecting information from a person table and then subsequent uh, subsequent spans are selecting from the address table. So it looks like this is a typical um, n plus one queries issue where you have a main query for the page and then for each uh, item within that page, there's a subsequent query happening. And that seems to be what's taking the time. Um, at this point, the uh, course of action would be to maybe think about restructuring the query that is used on the page to bring in that information directly, something along those lines. And then we have the next use case. In this case, users have been reporting that uh, there's this particular page which is taking a long time every time they lo load in. And they're saying it's unacceptable amount of time here. So we'll have a look at that page. That's the master detail page here. And you'll be able to see the loading bar going across, getting stuck a little bit, and then loading in. Now, as we see this page, you might be able to guess already what is the problem. We've got a large table here with a lot of components. But we can have a look again at Jager to see what is being reported. Refresh. OK, so where are we? There's one here, maybe. Nope. Let's just try that page again. Sometimes it can take a little while to get through, especially when it's a longer uh, or a greater amount of spans. Just see if that's come through. So just limit this to 100. OK, so here we go. Here's one that's taking 6.5 seconds and has nearly 4,000 spans. 
So again, this looks like it might be the case that this is causing the problem. Um, and across the top here, you have a time span of, uh, this is a line of all the spans being created and when they were created. You can kind of see there's a, a very dense block at the top, but not taking very much time. And then a bit more of a sparse block, but taking the rest of the time. And we can see here that the front end um, trace is taking, is, is the whole time. And then the back end traces are taking half the time. So what this is saying to, to me now is that the back end is taking about half the time, and then the front end is also taking half the time. And you can see here, we've got probably the same issue that we saw on the other page, the n plus one problem but that's not actually taking the majority of the time, ends to about here. Um, and then we've got these hundreds, 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 thousands of component creation spans. Uh, so as I suspected, the, uh, the, the components being created on the page, that's causing the, the extra time. So what's happening here is that we're having half the time at the back end creating those components and half the time at the front end rendering those components. And the next steps uh, in this case would be to uh, think about restructuring the page, maybe have a separate view for details on each row and move the components to a separate view. Or uh, there's also the option of in, in implementing lazy loading on the table so that not too many components are being shown on page at one time, or maybe a combination of both, depending on how uh, one of those affects the amount of time. Uh, now, the last thing I'm going to show is uh, not necessarily a problem, but it's about extending what telemetry is given by Observability Kit with your own application specific insights and information. So this can be useful if you understand the, uh, as, as developers, you already understand your own application better than we do. We're giving you insights to uh, Vardin specific um, data and, and uh, components and this kind of thing. Um, but then you might want to uh, provide the same tools with extra information, extra spans, and extra attributes. So in this case, I'm just going to switch across to um, some code. What we have here is the hello world view. This is the page that we've been seeing with the say hello button on it. And that's the say hello button there. And um, also being added is this long task button, which calls a long set start long task method and span example button, which calls a span example method. So this is two different ways to extend your application with custom spans. The first is here with the start long task method, and you can see an annotation at the top with span. This just tells Observability Kit, create a span for this method. Everything else will be handled for you, the timings of how long that method take, take, uh, took, um, and it'll give it a, a name of, in this case, hello world view dot start long, long task. That will be the name of your span. If you want a little bit more control over these things and to add in your own information from your application, then this second method Will be the way to do it. So in this span example, I'm actually uh, sending in information from the button click event, which is the client X and the client Y location in this case. Could be any information for your application. And then we're grabbing what's called a tracer from, global, uh, from Open Telemetry and then creating a new span. Um, this span example text would be the title that you'll see in your observability tool. And then here you can see that we're adding the client X and client Y values into that span. 
So then let's look at that in action in the application. So in here, in the hello world, we'll run this custom span example button or click it. And then in the Jaeger, you see that there's a, a front end span here and it's got inside it, you've got uh, the trace through here and this bottom one of the, here is the uh, custom span that we've just created. Um, and then inside the attributes, the tags that it says here, we have that client X and that client Y. So this you can see is quite a powerful addition to what you can do once you integrate observability kit into your own applications. Um, so that is our demonstration for the moment, and I'd like to hand back over to Jürgen. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you, Matthew, for that uh, demonstration. I'll switch to my screen again. Um, yeah, I just want to add to that uh, last use case. Now, Matthew, obviously, you were showing like how to add like more technical information there. Um, but that's also a way how you can add like business relevant information to those spans, like possibly ways to uh, about your information about your your user, like which user caused this error. So obviously, always being careful about uh, being compliant with data protection laws, anonymizing that data, and so forth. But uh, any data that is relevant for your business that will help you track down those uh, possible issues you can add that way to those spans. Um, some database record, this refers to things like that. So um, anything that will basically help you uh, trace down uh, problems. Um, now, I just wanna quickly summarize what we've been uh, discussing here. And then I think we have some time for uh, questions. Um, so observability kit is for you if you're aiming to monitor your volume applications end to end. So um, being able to monitor both the back end side as well as the, the front end side. Um, it's for you if you want to know how your system is performing. Um, and it is something that enables you to get um, alerts and react quickly if there are any issues in your system. Um, thus, it's a good way to improve reliability of your system and um, increase the user experience, improve the user experience of your application. Um, observability kit is also a good way to save, save time and cost by not rolling your own custom solution that you then have to maintain and will possibly give you a lot less information than what you could get uh, with uh, a more integrated solution like this one. And as it's based on open tele tele telemetry standard, it's also a great way to integrate this with the rest of your systems and use this to mul uh, monitor multiple components of a more complex setup, whether it's microservices, a cloud environment, et cetera, monitor anything from infrastructure to other uh, parts of the system that might not be embodied. So this is a really nice way to integrate all of that in one central place and one central setup to monitor everything. Um, which will also help a lot with tracking down problems because usually it's not entirely clear which system is causing an issue um, where the origin is of it. So that helps a lot to have that all of the data integrated in one place. Um, and then I just want to point out a few recent updates that we've done for those of you who have maybe following uh, Observability Kit for a while. Um, as of now, it's compatible with the uh, biggest Vardin versions in use so far, the latest and greatest Vardin 24, but also um, Vardin 14 and 23, which are uh, quite common among our customers. Um, we've recently added support for front-end tracing, as we've just seen now in the demo and the screencast earlier. And um, just to make it clear, while we've been showing um, the flow side, the Java uh, framework that we offer, um, it is also compatible with VOD in Hila. So um, our second framework where uh, the backend is written in Java, but the front end is uh, based on TypeScript, Lit, or React. Um, it's also compatible with that, and you can also use that as a monitoring solution for Hila-based apps. And I think with that, um, I'll hand it back to Brian, and uh, we have some time for Q&A now. And a few more links here if you want to dig a little bit deeper to our documentation and the demo that uh, Matthew was showing, which you can also find on GitHub and uh, play with yourself.
All right, it looks like we do have a few questions that have come in. Remember, if you do have a question, you can enter that into the panel at the top right of your or top bottom of your screen. And the first question we have is, can we observe front end events like browser JavaScript exceptions? And can we collect user ag agent data? Um, that was, um, especially the first part of that question was exactly what uh, we've seen in the screencast earlier and what Matthew has been uh, demoing also, I think, in demo one, um, where uh, the exception was actually happening on the browser side, on the client side, a JavaScript exception. And um, yes, those are, as of the latest version of uh, Observability Kit, those are supported and also showing up in your traces. All right, and another question, from which version of Vaadan is this available? I think that one, we actually just, maybe that question was uh, sent before this yeah. uh, slide. So it's uh, Vaadan 14, 23, and 24, uh, which it is compatible with. OK. And then next question, we deploy on Azure App Service. Does Observability Kit benefit us in this case? Um, not sure if Matthew has more to say about this one. I'm personally not an expert on Azure, um, but sure. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, but Matthew, maybe you have more to say about this. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, Observability Kit can be deployed onto uh, Kubernetes or Azure, uh, these kind of things. Um, basically, you do need to um, work on the, the infrastructure of how um, the apps are going to uh, connect to each other um, a little bit more, um, but that's to do with uh, the Kubernetes and Azure um, manifests and this kind of thing. But um, certainly, we've had um, we've had Observability Kit working with Observability tools within a Kubernetes environment, for example. Okay, great. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have. Uh, Matthew, you're gonna, you must have uh, explained everything really well. So it um, looks like we can give everyone some time back um, and a little bit early. Uh, so thanks again to everyone who joined us and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.